recap for us. What, what, what trials out there that you're aware of or that, that you're even participating in for that true M0 patient? For CRPC, for C, for, CRPC for, M0. For, for M0 yeah. CRPC. There's, there's, a, there's a few out, out there. The, and one, one thing, just to elaborate on, on the point and just about which reader is reading things, the recent, uh, in the IMAGINE trial, I think it was, which was looking at abiraterone in this state, uh, Crawford put out a paper where just on the screening of the cohort, I think it was something like 30% or so were actually it's found to have 37. metastatic disease. And that, to me, just meant that having like someone who's a dedicated reader of these scans or being more meticulous about it would identify them. But there's trials like, uh, like that one in sp and uh, um, there's looking at abiraterone. And then there's the PROSPER study that looks at enzalutamide. Um, enzalutamide being the, the triple action drug uh, inhibiting obviously in, important to the nucleus, binding to the, binding to the a AREs. Um, and then there's two newer kind of drugs that are, that are being evaluated, ARN509 and uh, um, ODM201. And those are in the Spartan trial and the uh, Aramis trial, respectively. My impression, and I'll defer to our medical oncologist, is that you know, enzalutamide had a low, but it seemed to be a small signal of, of seizure risk, um, probably because it passed the blood-brain barrier. The, the Bayer drug, the ODM201, I think has no ability to do that at all. And the thought is that you know, it would have less chance of, uh, of causing that side effect. In general, with the data that's already come out of some of these trials, it looks like the toxicity of the agents is similar to what you would have in the metastatic space. To me, it's a little bit um, uh, concerning in some ways um, because the, for example, for enzalutamide, although it's fairly well tolerated, some patients can have severe, really severe fatigue. And, you know, we talk about like the trade-offs. And certainly for patients who, have, who may be prone to a seizure disorder, you, you want to avoid, avoid that. So maybe I would defer to our medical oncologist to see what they think is going to be the best agent for this space because I think the drugs look fairly similar. They all should be evaluated. My kind of overarching thought is we have to move towards do we think we can be curative in this space? Is there a chance there? And it may be with these androgen blockades. It may come down the road with an immunotherapy. I'm not sure. Alicia, are you comfortable talking about Imagine? Um, sure. Okay. Sure. All right. She knows everything. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure. I don't want to put anybody on the spot here. So, so I think that's right. I think again, I think there is this there is this interest by by all the by all the manufacturers and all the and all the pharma companies to really move these 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 agents that clearly in monotherapy trials in, in metastatic CRPC patients they have a survival benefit. So we know that Janssen did imagine, which was a phase two trial. Um, I think Charles Ryan reported this out at ASCO. We know that that, that was a thousand milligrams of abiraterone acetate, but given uh, with just five milligrams of prednisone. Is that correct? It, it, it is. And I think that's, um, understanding that that's safe is actually really important, particularly because this was in the M0 Space. So we want to try to limit the, the, the side effects uh, of higher doses of prednisone if we can. And it did, did appear that there's a, a, a PSA progression, maybe delay. I think my concern with the trial is that there wasn't necessarily a control arm on, on this trial, but, but it did show that it was safe at least to do this. It was safe to do it in the M0 space. Uh, and, and there's hope then to continue the, the studies that are ongoing and, and, and really try to for further our understanding of whether this should be inserted in the M0 space. Um, but, but more than that, I don't know that we can say from the, from the IMAGINE trial. But as, as Ash said, I think it was, it was um, striking that so many of the patients that clinicians thought were M0 to enter into this study were actually not M0 when reviewed uh, for their true eligibility for the, for the trial. And, and this small space, M0 CRPC, uh, maybe a fleeting space that ultimately may be very challenging to find therapeutics directed specifically to those patients. Dan, is it surprising to you the pushback from urology about very small doses of prednisone that that we use with abiraterone? Which, you know, I think for the mo you know, for you and I that treat a lot of these patients, it doesn't it's not that big of a deal. But are you surprised at the pushback that comes from our colleagues? with the addition of a little bit of prednisone? <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's, it, well, again, I think we're trained to cut is to cure, okay? And so we have a different mentality than the medical oncologist. 
but I think it's like being comfortable with giving BCG or any of the agents that we now are. Once you get a familiarity level with this a certain product, you get over that hump. Uh, you know, again, we're only using physiological doses. We're only replacing what the body would normally give. We're not giving the same dose you give to somebody with bad arthritis or a bad injury or something like that. We're only giving the physiological dose. So, again, I, it's an uphill battle, like introducing any new drug into a space, but it's, you know, very easy to manage. All right. So, so when I think of the M0 space, uh, I think that the, the two biggest challenges of this space are um, how do you meet clinical endpoints with registration uh, uh, strategies, right? So uh, we don't know if re reducing your PSA or delaying ra radiographic progression-free survival can be utilized as a surrogate marker for outcome for survival. Um, to this day, the FDA the registration agency remain, survival remains the gold standard for FDA approval. So, so that's one of the challenges. Uh, Strive, which captured around 30% of patients with M0 disease, clearly demonstrated a, an, a, I mean, a striking delay uh, in, in RPFS, almost by 80% compared with patients who were randomized to bicalutamide in that M0 space. Imagine, as Alicia mentioned, also did the same, not only 90% plus PSA reductions to un almost undetectable, but also that delay in, R in, in RPFS that at the time when Chuck actually presented that data, the, there was no, the media has actually even been rich for those patients on, on imaging. So clinical trial endpoints is a big issue in that space. Now, whether or not ENSA is better than apalutamide, which is AR, the former ARM 509 or ODM remains to be defined. Uh, I, I do want to remind uh, all of us that, that ABI, outside of steroids, you know, ABI is a toxic agent and ensalutamide is a toxic agent. Not only is the fatigue, but the neurocognitive dysfunction that you see with ensalutamide treated patients is significant. And I remind you that we're moving these agents to the adjuvant space, to the pre-op space, right? So these agents do have a lot of uh, side effects. And, and there is also the biological concern that the early introductions of these agents, maybe in Abicure and so forth, you're actually simply basically unleashing those cells, if I'm allowed to use that expression, that really are gonna become aggressive and nothing is gonna be able to control th those those sort of that phenotype of cells, if you will. So, so I think that the, the other challenge that Spartan, Aramis, and, and the apalutamide trial are facing is that it's very difficult to randomize patients to an agent that it is already FDA approved, that has shown survival benefit, PSA reduction, tumor resist, resist defined response, or to a placebo. It's a very hard discussion with a patient, right? Because imagine, because that fraction of a stripe patients there is a lot of people out there that I don't know how they do it, but they do get coverage for ENSA or ABI in the M0 space. So to, to, to your point, you know, I predicted, and I was wrong, that urologists will love ensalutamide. Why? Because it's far more powerful, less agonistic, right? More expensive perhaps than bicalutamide, but there's a lot of people in the community who use monotherapy, right? And I'm hoping with the RAIN and with the STRIVE, then that monotherapy using the M0 space is gonna hopefully change. Whether or not starting ENSA or ABI in the M0 space is the right strategy right now, I'm not sure. I actually do not do it, but I don't think it's unreasonable to use it with the data that we have. 